Welcome back to Autism Live. As I mentioned earlier today, our next guest is one of my favorite people. We always love an opportunity to have Anita Lesko with us on the show. She's joining us uh, from a different place right now. She, uh, well, first of all, let's welcome her. Anita, welcome back to the show. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. I love your hats. You always have the best hats. Uh, it's wonderful. And so, Anita, tell us where in the world you are. It's like, where's Waldo, but where's Anita? <laughs> okay, so right now I'm in Troy, Michigan, which is uh, just like a suburb of Detroit, uh, because tomorrow I'm the keynote speaker at the Metro Parent Magazine Autism event, which I'm very excited and can hardly wait for that for tomorrow. So anybody who's that listening, who's in this area, come out and join us tomorrow. And so it's where... It's Troy, Romania. I'm sorry, where is it again? At the, uh, it's called the uh, Marriott Troy. Okay. And, um, and so is, I don't know if you even know the answer to this question, but do you know, is it still possible for people to get tickets so that they can come and hear you speak? That I'm not sure of. I, I don't know that. Okay. Well, knowing you, it's probably sold out or close to being sold out, but maybe you can get standing room only, folks. But that's a thing not to be missed to see Anita. And, and you were mentioning that you're there in the hotel and your husband is with you and you have your kitty with you as well, right? Yep, that's correct. And oh, also, I just want to mention this evening uh, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., I'm doing a book signing at the uh, Barnes & Noble in Rochester Hills, Michigan. Girl, look at you. You just, you are the busiest person I know. Because in addition to all this and writing all the books that you're putting out um, and having this very happy married life and traveling and speaking, uh, you know, you're, you find time to do all these other things and, and to give back to the autism community. You're amazing. Um, but let's, uh, well, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, don't forget, I spend about, you know, 40 hours a week in the operating room doing anesthesia. So I actually use up my, um, my vacation time, uh, which fortunately I get six weeks of paid, paid time off uh, every year. So I use up my vacation time to do all these uh, traveling all around the country speaking. Yes. So that's how I'm able to, to do all that. Plus In addition to a full-time job, which is just amazing, yeah. amazing, amazing, amazing. But I love the fact that you have six-week paid vacation. Is that because you've been working your job so many years? No, it's a, that, that's the nature of my job uh, as a nurse anesthetist. Uh, that's, a, you know, it's a, a professional job. Uh, that's how much vacation. Even if brand new graduates who just start, they get six weeks paid vacation as well per year to start off with. That's how much vacation you get. I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, Anita, you've got this new book out. What, now, you've written a bunch of different books. What number is this book? Uh, this is actually number four. Wonderful. And we've, we're, we're showing the, the book jacket right now. Um, and of course, notably forward by Dr. Tony Atwood, and then uh, put it back up there for just a second, uh, Traven, and a special note by Dr. Temple Grandin. But I wanted to look at, you've got those icons across the, um, the, the, the book. Talk to us about why those icons, Anita. Well, each one of those symbolizes different aspect of my life. Um, you know, we have the, the puzzle piece, obviously, for the autism. There's a picture of a fighter jet. That's because I spent seven years as one of my special interests. Um, I actually became an internationally published military aviation photojournalist because my big goal was to get a flight in a fighter jet, which I ended up getting that uh, flight in an F-15 fighter jet. Um, there's a picture um, of a horse because the horse, uh, I fell in love with horses at the age of two, and actually horses basically saved my life. Um, you know, I talk about in the book, I was the, like this pathetic, uncoordinated, uncoordinated kid. I used to trip on my own feet, um, you know, walk into walls, drop everything. Um, but it was the movement of being on a horse, that rhythmic movement that stimulated like my vestibular system and change, you know, my equilibrium, my coordination, my balance and everything. And it even, you know, speaking skills, social skills, I can't recommend enough the importance of folks with uh, children on the autism spectrum of somehow getting them uh, into horses, horse therapy, um, all that. There's all kind of studies 
um, that show, that document the positive effects of uh, horses for, for those on the autism spectrum. And I talk all about that in my book. And I actually describe uh, in very explicit details, um, and parents and therapists will, will love this to understand and hear um, what was it like to experience where my, my arms and legs aren't even connected. I didn't even know how to make them work. And, and I describe what that feels like, and then the change that started happening in me from the, being on the horses and everything, and how that came to totally change how my body functions and have body control over myself. Um, and I think that's a real important thing for, for parents and uh, therapists, uh, occupational therapists, um, everybody to hear that, to for somebody to verbalize in explicit detail this whole process. That's really amazing and, and wonderful to know that you fully explain all of that in, in the book. But now the two icons that are the first one and the last one, I would, I would guess that those are two of the most important things in your life. Okay, so there's the icon for the, uh, the medical symbol for the caduceus, um, and that's for, of course for my 30 plus year career as a certified registered nurse anesthetist. To date, I've done over 60,000 cases. Um, I specialize like in anesthesia for neurosurgery, uh, orthopedic joint replacement. I used to be on an organ transplant team, trauma and burns, um, really big stuff. You know, I've got patients' um, lives in my hands every day. Uh, so it's a really, it's a high stress job, but it's not so much it really, it's not the, the actual giving anesthesia and doing that, that's the stress to me. The stress is dealing with all the massive sensory overload um, that, that I have to um, endure every day, which is just a normal part of being in the operating room. Um, and you know, when I listen to all the neurotypicals, because I'm the only person on the spectrum, um, but I listen to all of them and they're all wiped out, exhausted by the end of the day. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, you gotta try being autistic and, and being able to, um, endure all of that, you know, between bright lights, I hear bone saws all day, hammering, um, multiple people talking all at one time, having, you know, multiple monitors going, having to keep track of, of you know, it seems like a hundred things all at once to keep track of all day long, interacting with people nonstop. It's a lot. It's it, a lot. It's a lot. Um, and there's often a life at stake. That while it's happening. So that's got to be extra added pressure. I can't even imagine, Anita. It, it is a lot. But as you said, you've been successful in doing this on a very high level for three decades now. That's an amazing accomplishment, an amazing accomplishment. And then the last icon uh, are the two wedding rings, which I think is probably one of the most joyous things in your life, right? Yes, that symbolizes, yes, my wedding to, to my beloved soulmate, Abraham. And, you know, um, we're, we're, like, we're like a little team, I guess maybe you want to call it. Like, you know, we, we work together, like, so well in the sense of, you know, when I'm busy, you know, writing, I'll be there at the kitchen table, which is, has become my office. And, and I'll be, you know, going at it on, on the computer writing, you know, more chapters or articles or blogs or whatever and um you know he's he's there he'll be cooking uh, there in the kitchen or he'll be doing the laundry or doing stuff to keep the house going and keep us going um and and his you know constant support for me and everything um so yes all that that's a very significant part of my life um and did i leave out any of those little no, I think you know they remind me of little charms on a charm bracelet. Yeah, that's actually what I was thinking too, and I think it's a beautiful cover. You know, I mean, um, because it's it's all there, um, and and um, it's. I think it's just a lovely, lovely uh, way of looking at it. So these are just some of the things that you talk about in the book, um, and for people who haven't seen you on the show before. Um, you didn't get a diagnosis early on. We all, people always talk about early diagnosis, early diagnosis. That was not your story. Um, and, and how do you, you know, in terms of you being successful, do you feel at all like get it, not getting the diagnosis um, early helped you or did it hinder you? What, what are your thoughts on that, Anita? 
it made me a stronger person because, okay, I didn't get diagnosed until I was 50, 5 zero, and I only discovered that I'm on the spectrum by chance. I mean, I, like, okay, so I go the first 50 years of my life, I know I'm different, I don't fit in, I have all these, you know, in my earlier days, all the coordination problems, all these seemingly bizarre problems that nobody else seems to have, all kind of social problems, um, and it just keeps going on. And I always felt like I was on the outside of life looking in. So it was just constant nonstop obstacles to overcome. But yet I always persevere, never gave up. But early on, and this is something that book focuses on, it isn't a book like about my life. It's not an autobiography. I use my life events as the backdrop to talk about how I learned the power of the mind and how to use visualization to achieve your goals. Now, I learned that very early on, how powerful your mind is, and everybody has this power within them. If they want to tap into it, they can and can make significant achievements, okay? Um, there's a big thing about positive thinking. I mean, you know that, everybody knows you can read all about it and everything, but actually doing it and visualizing things, and I discuss, I mean, right in the forward, I mean, the, uh, the introduction, and I talk about how I would, when I wanted to do something, I'd watch other people doing it over and over for hours and hours and hours, and it was kind of like downloading it into my brain so that then I could watch that video in my brain over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then I would think about it, think about it, watch that video, and then I would envision myself doing the activity from the two perspectives. One, as if I was watching myself do it, and the other perspective of me actually doing it. So by the time I actually did it, my brain actually thought that I actually did it already. Wow. Um, as I went through my whole life and learning how to do this visualization process, then as I get, came to be an adult, well, then I learned about that's how, like, um, these top elite Olympic athletes, they use this visualization um, in, in their training. It's actually classified as actually even more important than the physical training is the training of their mind. I mean, you, these, these, like, Olympic skiers and ice skaters, they'll visualize themselves like the skiers going down the mountain at 80 miles an hour well, they visualize that in their mind hundreds of times before they actually start skiing down that mountain. So by the time they actually are skiing down the mountain, their body and their mind thinks they've already done it, so they do it so much better. And th this is all, you know, documented research, scientific, backed, and everything. Um, there's Dr. Norman Doidge. He's written uh, several books. <clears throat> about this visualization and neuroplasticity. Now, you see, people used to think, uh, scientists and researchers even used to think your brain was a static thing, and however you were born, that's kind of just it. Well, it's not the case. You can reshape the thinking in your brain and, like, reprogram it. I call it rewiring, and that's actually what they do call it, rewiring, with this ability that your brain has with this neuroplasticity, the ability to change. So throughout this book, yes, I talk about the different aspects of my life, but I keep going back to that vis visualization and neuroplasticity, and I give this, my seven steps how I do this, and I very clearly, very explicitly go over in this book to teach people, because not only people on the autism spectrum, anybody who wants to make positive changes in their life can use this method. But I'm hoping that, that people on the autism spectrum especially will start to incorporate this because you can learn, do so many things with it. Learn, you can learn executive functioning skills. You can learn whatever it is that you you have a goal or a dream, start using this visualization process and you can get there. And this that's the whole purpose of this book. Like I said, it's not like it's just some autobiography because that's not the purpose of it. I want to help others be able to achieve their best life possible. And in the forward, what Dr. Tony Atwood wrote, 
when I read what he wrote, I felt so overwhelmed. He saw it. He saw the, the, the he calls it the bridge. This is the bridge of what, we, what you know, scientists and research, research all knows about autism to bridging over to that thing to be able to, to do these things. Um, and he feels that this visualization and everything needs to be incorporated into regular like therapy and education system and everything to do for autistic individuals. So I'm really excited about this book and I hope it reaches far and wide and, it, and it's not, it, it's for everybody. It's not just for, you know, individuals on the spectrum. It's for parents, parents especially, because they can learn how to do this visualization and help teach their children how to do it. Um, it's for educators, therapists, uh, everybody, anybody who wants to make a positive change. What a wonderful thing. Where can we get the book, right? Because it's available. At, it came available, was it yesterday or the day before yesterday? On Monday, uh, April on Monday. 1st. Okay. So where can we get it, Anita? You can get the book on Amazon.com or like Barnes & Noble. Um, I mean, if you go on my website, which is AnitaLesco.com, and you click, go to where it says books, and if you click on it, that'll take you to Amazon. Um, of course, every, I, I do all my own shopping from Amazon, so that's my first <laughs> place. I, <laughs> I love that. So, Anita, what, when did you learn this about uh, visualization, and uh, were you, and how did you, like, did somebody introduce this to you, or did you find it on your own and then do research on it and realize how powerful it was? How did this come to you? When I was about six years old, and there's a little story in the book, so I don't want to kind of give it away. Yeah, don't give anything was away. when I learned the power of the mind. And there's a specific incident that, that enabled me to learn that power. From there, when I started to be, like, as a working student at a stable where I used to work, which I started working there when I was about 12, and I wanted so bad to be able to ride horses and someday learn how to jump them and, and ride in competition and everything. But my family was very poor, so there was that they couldn't, my parents could not afford riding lessons or buy a horse or anything like that. So the only way it was going to be was I had to uh, get a job as a working student at this big stable near my home. And uh, at, in return for like shoveling out horse stalls and all kind of physical work there, I would get riding lessons and riding time. Well, here's a kid that's so uncoordinated, of course. So I would sit and watch and watch and watch the other riders and the people, even, even down to things like cleaning a horse stall. You know, I was so uncoordinated, I'm thinking, how am I going to pick up a wheelbarrow loaded with the contents of that stall and, and wheel it down the aisle up into the ramp and then dump the contents into the, the dumpster. So I would study how the other people, the workers did it and I would watch over and over. And I started realizing that when I did this process, then when I would actually do it, it was starting to happen. And the same thing with riding. Now, when I used to take, start to take riding lessons and even into my adulthood, um, cause I can remember, I guess I was in my thirties and there was this riding instructor. He was a really good riding instructor, um, except he was kind of, um, ex how should I say, a little arrogant or whatever. But um, he would tell me, you know, you're, uh, I'm up on a horse, so, so you, I, I'm on a moving object. And so then, you know, if people know what trotting or cantering is, so he's hollering out, you know, to do, to, you know, push my right heel down and push my left shoulder back and my, right hand or thumb needs to be doing this. So all these commands um, that I'm like, I could not follow or, or, or do what he would actually ask at the time. Um, it would take me a week of go home. I would have to write it down, all of these things what I was supposed to do and think about it for the week, visualize it over and over. Then the following week, I would be able to reproduce that, those things on the horse. Of course, this guy used to scream at me, what, he said, you're less than an idiot. Can't you just do it? And I'm like, no. And then I can't do it. And he would say, why? And I said, I don't know. All I know is I can do it next week. 
And he would say, I never saw anything like this in my life. This is crazy. And I said, well, that's all I can tell you. And then the following week, I would be able to produce the, you know, the movement or whatever. But that's how my brain works. Um, and so I would talk about this, you know, in the book in very explicit detail. I'm sure, you know, it's probably boring at some point. Um, your writing is but, never boring, Anita. Never. Well, because look, I think I wanted people to understand what was actually happening in my body and how these things were able to come about. Um, so I felt that I think, you know, parents are going to enjoy to read it. I've heard over and over parents say, I just wish I can have the opportunity to, to understand my child's mind. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Well, now they're going to get that opportunity for sure to see what's like living in an autistic body. Um, so everything that I did then th throughout my life, I realized if I wanted to really do it, I have to use this visualization process, even in my anesthesia training, even in photography, when I wanted to take pictures of jets, every single thing I use the visualization to get me there to my goal. And other people can do these things too. Like I said, I very, ex in extreme detail, uh, map out my seven-step process of how to do this. I love this. Now, did you teach this to your husband? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. And, um, and did he have any idea about it before you taught it to him? Had he ever heard of visualization or not at all? No, no never, um, never anything. Um, when we first met, I mean, all he knew how to do, he can uh, boil water to make coffee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I taught him how to, how to cook. I mean, now he can cook just like me, which I can cook like a Emeril Lagasse. Um, and there again, oh, now here's a little story. I had gotten thrown off my horse back in 2009. So I spent three months laid up with a whole lot of broken bones. Okay. And my mom had brought uh, a little portable TV in, into my room and I watched the food network. I knew how to cook prior to this. Okay. But. For, so for three months, uh, you know, 10 hours a day, I'm watching the Food Network and watching Emeril Lagasse and all the top chefs and everything. So I learned a lot, a lot of techniques. Um, so I end up teaching all this to Abraham and how to visualize how to do it over and over. And now he cooks just like I do. And do you um, say the right? bam when you spice things? Do you, do you say bam like Emeril? Well, sure. You got to <laughs> do bam. Pick it up. <laughs> Uh, on one of the bands, your computer, I think we, we're, we're just seeing the top of your head. I don't know if you can tilt it down a little bit, but um, that's amazing. Well, so it's changed everybody's life then around you. And Anita, you move in some pretty impressive circles. I mean, Dr. Temple Grandin is a friend of yours. You uh, wrote a book about, uh, with her, about her, the stories that I tell my friends, which is an amazing book, one of my favorite books. Um, and so when you're talking about this with other people who are on the spectrum, do you find that it's something that, that is brand new to them that they never knew about before and you're helping to change their lives? Yes. Nobody has, uh, that I've met in, in the autism community has ever, you know, uh, I don't know if they necessarily, nobody has said they've never heard of it necessarily. But nobody's ever said that they have heard of it, really, um, and nobody certainly has been doing it. Um, and, I, and you know, I used to be involved in um, ice dancing, and that I was around a lot of like Olympic level ice skaters a lot, um, and also with the horses. Now, one of the things that I used to find fascinating when I used to go to the United States equestrian team to their Olympic training center, because I lived about one hour away. This was back up in New Jersey. And they would have like um, Olympic selection trials. So I would see like the best uh, riders in the United States there. And, and I used to see them before it was time for them to do their, their ride. They would go off in some far corner all by themselves. And I'd see them just facing into a corner with their eyes shut but they were kind of going over with all their motions with their body as if they were riding the horse through their, uh, you know, through the competition thing. And I realized, wow, they're doing it too. 
okay, so so then I'm, I'm on the right track of what I'm doing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I, all all Olympic people and and top elite sports athletes use this visualization thing. So, and research documents that it really works. So, like I said, I've been doing it my whole life, and I've accomplished many many things. So. I, Hopefully, other people will want to try it. Well, you are an autism success story, and it makes great sense to me. I, we we do a segment on the show that we call uh, a mindfulness moment, and um, we talk about different ways. Because you know, when you talk about um, being mindful or doing visualization or creative visualization, I, I'm sure you get this all the time, Anita, talking about this. But I certainly get people who say, yeah, I'm not good at that. I don't know how to meditate. I don't know how to do, you know, uh, visualization. And so on the show, we try to do just a little thing every week where we talk about different ways that people can do it because it isn't, doesn't have to be just one way. And I was realizing as you were talking that this whole idea of visualizing yourself doing it as if you're watching yourself and then doing it the other way as if you're in your body that's something I've been missing when I do things. So that, I mean, that resonated with me like a chord being struck, Anita. That was like, oh, of course. Of course, that's such a powerful tool. But do you find that people, um, do you hear, have people say to you a lot, oh, I just, I just don't, I don't meditate. I'm not good at that. I don't know how to do that. Or I don't know how to hold yes, a picture in my head. I hear people say that. Yes, that's definitely, yes, I hear that, and, and that's why I, in, in fact, there's a chapter in the book, How to Help Decrease Anxiety Through Using This Visualization Method, and I go, again, in the very explicit detail, in the step-by-step -step methodical process, and I give, like, different little exercises to, you know, to visualize this, and then I, I go step-by-step -step what, what to visualize, um, and how you start this out where you, you learn how to tune everything out because it gives your, your brain, like if you're trying to decrease anxiety, your brain has to, to be able to calm down and shut out everything. Um, you know, as a person on the spectrum who um, I, I can get very anxious, um, you know, at various different things. And even if I'm not anxious, I'll find something to be anxious about. Um, and then I'd say to myself, okay, I've got to do my little method. And then I stand there, and then I, you can be, you learn to do it anywhere, even in a crowded environment, like at an airport um, or something like that. But you initially started out just in your home in total peace and quiet. And there can't be any distractions, you know, no cell phones binging, binging, no TVs on, no radios, no, no music on, nothing. Total quiet. That's how you learn to just focus initially, like on your breathing. And then you start the thought process of what to think about and only focusing on the specific thing that it is that you're going to think about. And it, then, then you can start to learn it. And it's, it, then once you learn how to do it, then it's very easy to, to start to do it whenever you need to, like to decrease anxiety. Or if you're going to use it to uh, visualize something, a goal you know, to do or something. But... Anybody can, pretty much anybody can learn to do this. It does take practice. It isn't going to happen the first time you do it, but you can't give up. And that's the whole thing. You have to be willing to put the time in um, to practice it, you know, until you can get, it might take you two weeks. It might take you two months. But don't give up because it doesn't happen on the very first try. You keep going over that step-by-step -step process, and then you'll be able to do it. And we're almost out of time, Anita, but do you and your husband ever meditate together and visualize together? Um, actually, yes, we do. We, we love to uh, be where there's snow, and we have this, this scene where we like to visualize being by a fieldstone fireplace with a big picture window watching the snow coming down in the early evening with deer outside by a pond. I so love that, it. That, that's the art. Our, our favorite scene to, to visualize. It sounds very Dr. Zhivago, and I know that's a big movie that you love. Um, that's yes. wonderful. I know your mom loved that movie. 
Uh, Anita, I just think you're amazing, and I love you. And I, this book, I think, is going to be a ginormous book and help a whole lot of people. We really want to encourage everybody to get the book um, and leave reviews for it on Amazon. It's available now. Is there any place else you want them to leave reviews? Um, I mean, I know, you know, Amazon, I don't, I guess like Barnes and Noble and other book sites like that okay. have review thing. I owe you um, a review. I'm, I'm remiss. I owe you a review. Um, but you know that I, I love you and I love everything that you do. So, and you're going to be speaking tonight, you're signing books and tomorrow you're going to be speaking. Tell them where you're going to be tonight and tomorrow again. Okay. Tonight I'm going to be at the Barnes and Noble in Rochester Hills, Michigan. And then tomorrow I'm at the uh, Metro Parent Magazine Autism event at the uh, Marriott Troy, uh, which starts at 8 a.m. tomorrow. My speaking time is at um, 2.45, I believe it is, in the afternoon. Okay, fabulous. Not to be missed. Uh, please give your husband a big hug from us. And I hope you guys have a wonderful time in Detroit and that you get to that snowy place with a fireplace soon. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I love you too, Shannon. Thank you so much, Anita. Sending you big, warm hugs. And hopefully I'm going to get to see you sometime soon. You take care, yes, okay? Indeed. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, we are just about out of time. I think we're a minute over here. I just want to say uh, we're back again tomorrow. Tomorrow is Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Our very special guest, we've got uh, Rena Vanzo, who's going to talk with us from Lineage In about why you might want to consider doing genetic testing um, and, and what the reasons for it are, what the benefits are. And then we have the fabulous up-and-coming YouTube star, Kenny Valdivia, is going to be with us to talk about why that's super important to him. You're going to love him. He's super fabulous, awesome. And don't forget this weekend, if you're in town, if you're by Disneyland, you've got to come to Fullerton to go to the Mardi Gras for autism. We will be there. We've got great prizes, and we're very excited about that. So make sure that you're at Fullerton Cares this Saturday. It's from 11 to 4, the Mardi Gras for autism. Be there or be square. We're going to be back tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.